All right, uh, let's get started. So uh, good evening, uh, good morning in Singapore. Welcome to this lecture here. Um, I think um, many of you have, have heard me say that before, but of course, I'm delighted to see all of you here uh, for physics and contemporary architecture. This is a series that Nagel, my colleague and I are, are co-hosting. It goes together with our course of the same name. And this year, um, as well as in the two prior years that we've had this lecture series, we've heard from some of the leading architects and engineers who demonstrated how science principles and concepts play out in contemporary architectural practice. But so far, these lectures have focused pretty much exclusively on the built environment. And thus we have neglected, if you want, in our series of talks, an aspect that is crucial to how inhabitants of buildings and, and whole cities experience their surroundings. And that is landscape. The trees and flowers and natural growth that connects us as well as our man-made structures to nature. And I'm therefore delighted that tonight's lecture by Stefan Lambrecht will move the spotlight onto landscape architecture. His point is that playing, uh, paying close attention to landscape and urban design and architectural expression can be much more than superficial aesthetic integration. To the extent that we want to connect with nature, it is also about what he calls future proofing of our existence. So Stefan combines an architectural background with extensive landscape experience. He started his career as an architect and urban planner in Belgium. Then he received an MA in housing and urbanism at the Architectural Association in London and eventually switched to landscape architecture. And then in 2014, he joined Grant Associates and that's a pioneering international landscape architecture practice with offices both in the UK and Bath and also in Singapore. And in Singapore, Stefan currently leads uh, the studio of Grant Associates, where he manages a wide array of projects uh, all over Asia. And so in this lecture tonight, he will focus specifically on Singapore, a city that has become a large scale experiment for innovative ways of integrating landscape into a densely populated urban area. Stefan, please go ahead. Okay, uh, good evening to you all. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Heinrich. Um, you can hear me well? Yes, you can. Yeah. Hear? Okay, good. Um, so I'm, I'm very honored to, to be invited here for this physics and contemporary architecture lecture series. So over the last weeks, I've taken some time to reflect on our landscape projects, uh, looking back at what we have delivered, and looking forward to where we are heading as a practice and as a discipline. I hope you will enjoy the story I will share with you uh, today. So as designers, we often present projects in isolation. At most, we talk about immediate adjacencies. But the reach of landscape projects goes, however, beyond the nearby individuals, like this mother with her children here. The impact of our projects is bigger and profounder. And today, I want to root our landscape projects in the Singaporean nationwide context, both the environmental physical context, and the social political context, you know, that they, they are interrelated, especially here in Singapore. Singapore prides itself on being a, a forward looking city, a green city, a livable city. But what lies behind it? You know, every landscape has its reasons. But before talking about Singapore and our landscape projects, I want to go back in time. Um, I will share a few historic, uh, iconic examples, which are very telling about the role of landscape or the potential role of landscape architecture in society. For centuries, people have manipulated the landscape uh, for more than just agriculture and horticulture. Um, Islamic gardens, like the one I show here in Alhambra in, in Granada, are, are often called paradise gardens. They are places for rest, reflection, and contemplation. These gardens are a very practical response to the concerns of a very dry and warm climate. But they transcend the environmental context. They are actually an earthly reflection of life in paradise, which is promised to the faithful. Chenon saw a beautiful fairy tale castle, which comes with this amazing classical form of French garden. You probably know the castle from the imagery, maybe the garden is a bit less known. 
Um, but just observe the picture. This is 16th century Renaissance, no more intimate medieval world gardens, but these bold expressions of humans bringing order to nature and subjugating it. Strict geometrical patterns and rules about proportions, rejecting the organic and chaotic qualities of nature. Yes, it responds to the site sitting parallel to the river and the treatment of topography is always clever in these French gardens. But, you know, beautiful perspectives are being composed to the castle. And, and, and this is a time where people express their understanding of the universe, even society in their landscapes, consciously or unconsciously. And it's, it's about a perfect order based on symmetry, proportion and mathematics. Two centuries later, different country, Stourhead, society has evolved and uh, so has design. You know, Stourhead in England is, is not a garden for royalty or nobility, but it's designed for a successful banker for himself. This is, this is a more liberal society. The garden looks more unpredictable. It also seems to have more layers. It appeals more to to subject the sense of the amount of these beautiful crafted positions we don't appreciate today. It's, it's, it's an idealized nature allowing the expression of some natural forms. And the expression of the middle class, you know, the garden in its controlled randomness is still a recent overview of history landscape architecture because this is you know about science also. I just wanted to mention Darwin. I don't refer to Darwin because he commissioned a very special garden, but because he used his garden as a place for research, to find his theoretical work, a place to think. You know, he wrote his On the Origin of Species in Kent, in the UK, uh, while he was living on his estate. Uh, here. Landscape and nature are here less controlled. And he called this his thinking part, inspire him. A different view on what landscape can do to you. And in the 19th century, 19th green lungs and places to escape from the city. Yes, they are ideals of society, but they're becoming more functional. These are parks to be used in different ways. It's not just about walking in or resting. In. They contribute to the health of cities. And still today, these are popular places. The democratic places where you know we create and share memories. And today, as landscape architects, we are still designing or upgrading this kind of parks as, as cities expand and evolve. So I'm skipping the 20th century here and, and move straight to the 21st century. You know, I don't have the whole day to talk to you about landscape. So Grant Associates Singapore took the initiative with a few other practices here in Singapore to set up the local declaration for the climate and biodiversity emergency. Looking forward, we are going to need much more than just big city parks. It's, it's, it's more than just about, about addressing the needs of the city and its citizens in, in a very defined area. It is about the health and survival of mega cities, uh, large territories, entire nations, and uh, unfortunately, the, the planet itself. So where is landscape architecture evolving to? What holds the future for us landscape architects? So one place to discover part of this future for landscape is Singapore, a small red dot in Southeast Asia. And the, and the small dot that I put on the map here is probably even too big. So I needed to put the arrow. <laughs> Singapore has been at the forefront of landscape design for the last decade because of its limited size uh, and its willingness, ability to reinvent itself continuously. When you don't have much space like Singapore, you just need to be more creative with it. The tropical climate here in Singapore also helps with what we're trying to achieve here. Singapore doesn't have any natural resources. If you have to import water, food, all basic necessities, you are vulnerable as a country. Even with friendly neighbors, you can't always rely on them. The recent and ongoing global disruptions have demonstrated that borders can close unexpectedly and imports halted. So compare here uh, Singapore here with Chicago City. Singapore is a small independent nation, home to 5.7 million people. Within a similar area, Chicago City is only the home of half the population of Singapore. 
But within its territory, Singapore needs to provide not only for housing, industrial areas, parks, and infrastructure, but also for food production. International airport, okay, Chicago may also have that, uh, but there's more than one airport here. Uh, harbor, cemeteries, places of worship, military facilities. There's a lot to fit in a very small area while you have double the amount of people. You know, we can't just let it go into the suburbs because there are no suburbs. How can you further densify the place when all partners in society want and need more space for their activities and their needs? Part of the answer is careful planning. So let's look at the planning components. You can see Singapore's post-independence planning aspirations in the 1971 urban plan. At the time, you know, United Nations assisted Singapore. The big green core in the center which protects water supply already from the beginning, uh, as much as, uh, you know, as, as, as providing greenery. And you can see the initial structure of parks and green links. And this is uh, a more recent uh, master plan. And you can see that actually the structure is still pretty much there. Uh, um, it's just much more intricate and every area has been zoned for something or reserved for future use. So besides planning, planting is important for the Singapore's narrative. Every year in the rainy season, Singapore dignitaries and ordinary people will go out and plant trees in the rainy season. So on the left, you see Lee Kuan Kuan Yew, Singapore's first prime minister, planting a Cratoxylum formosum in 1963. Every time we propose a Cratoxylum formosum in our projects, everybody says, oh yeah, the first tree. And on the right, you see the current prime minister planting a tree a few years ago. Obviously, trees offer environmental benefits, but there are other reasons for planting trees. Trees provide a strong sense of equality, green spaces for all Singaporeans, not just for the happy few. And trees really express society's aspirations. And I also did my part planting a few trees uh, at the end of last year. Planting a few trees is, however, not going to be enough when facing the climate challenge. So less than 60 years after the prime minister planting his first tree, Singapore is planning to plant 1 million trees by 2030. Many cities and countries around the world have made or are making a similar pledge. And I believe Singapore can and will do it. You know, but the passion for trees and planting is an essential part of Singapore's young history. It's not just a very, it's not just a, a recent trend. So what binds Singaporean space are the rigor of planning and the passion for planting. There are, however, other components that shape Singaporean landscape, like water, food, heritage, etc. Lots of interests which we need to balance in our limited space, in our limit, you know, in our uh, in, in our limited landscape areas. So Singapore has become this large-scale urban experiment. You know, it's city-engineered multiple levels where landscape, nature are an integral part of the ability and the need to densify. You know, we, we need uh, planning and planting to improve livability and ultimately to create the nation's identity. Singapore's urban, urban model is that of a city in nature. That's the motto of Singapore. We want to be a city in nature. It used to be a, a city in a garden. Now we call it a city in nature. And against this background, Grant Associates has been steadily building up a rich portfolio in Singapore, contributing to the city state becoming a true city in nature. And the key motto for Grant Associates for years has been reconnecting people with nature. And this fits perfectly in the Singaporean narrative. Contact with nature benefits people. Improves our health, both physical and mental. And also nature can benefit actually from the right connections with people because awareness, knowledge and positive experiences with nature will create a platform to help protect and create opportunities for nature. So the grant associates projects I share today are quite diverse, but they are all but one in Singapore. They all contribute to the transformation of Singapore in different ways. And I will share about how in our landscape projects we integrate strategies often nationwide strategies on water, greenery, food production, biodiversity, mobility, etc. So while our work is infused by our understanding of the physical world and the needs of a nation, we still create a difference by adding imagination to our creations. So how to design a landscape befitting a city in nature? Let's start with our beginning in Singapore. 
Grant Associates is a UK firm which came to Singapore after winning the design competition for Gardens by the Bay. So Gardens by the Bay has become the iconic symbol for Singapore's green aspiration. It's a 54 hectare park for the people in future prime CBD area. The government decided to build a park before releasing the surrounding land for urban development. It's a bold economic move. You know, the, the, the land uh, value is quite high and it was given to a park. The picture here is, is from soon after the opening. The vegetation is still young. So you can see the structure of the park very well. Let me try to kind of use my pointer. Um, at the waterfront, you see the two conservatories, uh, the super trees here at the center, Dragonfly Lake in the foreground and the reservoir uh, on the left, the sea in the background. So botanic gardens are all about celebrating individual plants, but the gardens by the bay adds an experiential layer to it. You know, the Cloud Forest Dome creates an exhilarating immersive plant experience. When you enter, you're immediately greeted by this impressive waterfall. The noise, the humidity, it, it all sets the tone for the rest of your visit. You know, you, you can't enter without getting a little bit wet. And as you continue your journey, you walk alongside the base of this massive 35 meter high mountain clad with plants. It makes the people feel humble towards nature. Each individual plant is celebrated and the vegetation is set in this exciting curated environment. The mountain within the dome in daytime, the whole experience is you go up and then you go, you walk slowly down. It's a journey uh, around and down the planted mountain. And, and your perspective is continuously changing and the mountain within the dome at night. And as you work your way down, the immersive experience only gets stronger. You forget you are in a city. The architecture, even if it's very beautiful and very engineered, it just disappears. Imagination originates with the designer having a dream. But the public needs to willingly step into this dream appreciating and taking ownership of the imagination. So let's talk about the super trees. The super trees are the ultimate expression of the integrated energy system within gardens, by the way. They add value to the landscape for people and for biodiversity. And these are also environmental engineering devices. PV cells capture solar energy on top. Some of the super trees act as air supply and air exhaust for the cool conservatories. And their shape, orientation, location, they help with the microclimate, providing shade in the cooling wind flow. The super trees in the beginning. The super trees five years later. Landscape often get better with time. The experience changes. I think it's one of the most fascinating aspects in landscape architecture, one of the reasons I kind of moved to landscape architecture and the super trees at night. The people lying down on the floor are there to enjoy the light show and are looking up at the canopies. And these are young Asian ladies and they care a lot about their hair and their dresses. Still, they lie down on the paving where people have walked only a few, a few minutes before. If we as a designer can manipulate people's behavior in an unexpected way, we have done something special. This is a quiet evening. Normally, there are many more people attending the show. The elevated walkway between the super tree offers dramatic views across the gardens and, and across the city. And so the super trees are enjoyed by kids and by adults. You know, the gardens are a popular setting for photo shoots, movies, and even fashion shows. So everybody identifies the gardens and also uh, Singapore uh, with the super trees. Here in the foreground lies Dragonfly Lake. And the lake system is a bit the unsung hero of the gardens. Similarly to the energy system, the lake system integrates aesthetic and environmental processes. The planted islands in the Dragonfly Lake stand out as a haven for wildlife, especially bird species, many which have uh, built their nest on these islands. And aquatic plants line the, uh, line the islands and, and provide habitats for frogs, fish, and dragonflies, small animals. And this fits in the wider strategy of PUV, Asians responsible for water in Singapore. Every drop counts. Since its independence, water has been a major concern for Singapore. Malaysia committed to supplying Singapore with water after its independence, but then, but since then, Singapore has become self-reliant. It didn't want to rely on its neighbor. 
So all the water in the blue areas gets captured and directed to the reservoir. So most, water rain, most rain that falls down will be used at, in one way or another. No rainwater gets wasted or hardly any rainwater gets wasted. Singapore has no natural resources, but it has plenty of rain. Even the driest month in Singapore produces more rain than the wettest month in Chicago. So the water circulation in, in Gardens by the Bay was designed such that all rainwater falls away uh, to the edges of the garden, but away uh, from the reservoir. So into the lake system where it is cleaned. The water then flows all around the garden through a channel into Dragonfly Lake in the west. And from the Dragonfly Lake, surplus water spills over into the reservoir through the bog garden. So alongside the lake, the Dragonfly Lake, the two kilometer long boardwalk enables people to get down uh, to the water and to learn about the lake's ecosystem. The edges of the lake are shallow so that marginal vegetation can colonize the area. The plants act as a natural ecofilter before the runoff is discharged into the reservoir. To contrast with the more accessible man-made looking dragonfly lake, the Kingfisher Lake was made to look much more natural. Wide diversity of water plants and swamp plants are planted around and in the water bodies, creating different habitats for wildlife and different kinds of aesthetics. And Dragonfly Lake is a popular spot for wedding pictures. This, is all, this space is all about water engineering, but also about making enchanting spaces for people to enjoy. One of my favorite spaces in Gardens by the Bay is Silver Garden. Not because of a particular environmental function it's, it performs or biodiversity that, value that it adds, but purely because of its beauty. No architecture can achieve what this particular palm, Bismarckia nobilis, achieves here. The texture, the color, the light, the shadow. You know, these, these, these palms are beautiful by themselves, but it's a journey underneath that makes the Silver Garden a must-see, must-experience space. And play is important in Gardens by the Bay, but just like in all our parks, it's, it's like in all our parks. Uh, and more and more, we're looking at play experiences for all generations. Physical and mental health are closely linked. So these kids are enjoying the water play area in Gardens by the Bay. It's a few years ago. On the left is my bigger. Uh, and the not so brave little girl on the right is my daughter. So all the kids can run around in that ever changing landscape of water, dance, water months, water spouts. Uh, for the toddlers uh, and the lesser ones, there's the fish fountain. Landscapes are about creating spaces to share experiences. Like I shared experiences with my children here. The park is not only enjoyed by children or by adults. Otters discovered the gardens in the last years. They liked it and made it their home. The gardens were never planned for otters. We, it was planned for dragonflies, butterflies, birds. It was surprising to have them in this very urbanized area, so close. And they were attracted to Marina Bay and the gardens because of the abundance of fish in clean water. And the clean water is the result of a, the nationwide effort. It's not just gardens, by the way, but gardens, by the way, contributed to that improved water quality. So as a design, if you do the right thing, as a landscape design, you do the right thing, unexpected positive outcomes might happen. Create sensible landscapes and biodiversity will flourish and animals will appear. Close encounters with wild nature, that's the ultimate experiences we wish for in a city in nature. It's not about humans invading nature, but it's about nature invading cities. Next project, Robinson Tower here in Singapore, celebrating trees in cities. You can see gardens, by the way, on the right. The site of Robinson Tower is this very small purple triangle on the left in the center of the CB. Large high profile parks like Gardens by the Bay are important for cities, but we also need to cherish the smaller green spaces. Combine a lot of green fragments and you still can uh, contribute to the greening of the cities. And we should explore how we can merge greenery with architecture in our densely built up cities. So the, to this purpose, Singapore devised a spatial policy in its city center called Landscape Replacement Area or LRA. This means you can develop a plot of land in the city center, but you, your green landscape area in the project needs to be bigger than your site area. So landscape can be on the ground plane, in the sky or on the walls. So let's illustrate this with a very simple example. Your plot is 10,000 
square meter, sorry about using metric scale here, 10,000 square meter, you comply with the LRA by, for instance, having 5,000 square meter of terraces on different levels. So there are lots of additional uh, Singapore likes its rules. Uh, and one of these rules is that, for instance, 40% of the landscape needs to be softscape. And this is gradually transforming uh, Singapore's landscape or urban uh, city center. On the left is a view from our project showing all the skyscraper, a continuous sea of metal, stone, concrete, and glass. That's the context. Uh, some streets of, uh, soften the densely built up urban fabric, oh, but uh, some street trees, but they're just streetscape fragments. Uh, and in the center of the slide is, is our Thai triangular uh, site. And on the right is a view from Robinson Road to the new tower. So the public realm in front of the tower is dominated by this tree, a yellow flame. It's a beacon of greenery in this man-made world. Besides improving the general microclimate and air quality, the umbrella shade canopy provides ample shade for pedestrians. Remarkably, this tree is the only spatial element preserved in the redevelopment of the site. There used to be an older, uh, another skyscraper, uh, a smaller skyscraper in, in, on this spot. So the ground level was changed, but we managed to engineer a new public realm around a mature tree. We can't just talk about planting new trees, but we also need to preserve existing ones. Pedestrian traffic benefits more from this majestic tree without actually harming its shallow roots. How did, how did we do this? Firstly, in plan, we reorganized the public realm around the tree. We rationalized, widened and centralized the footpath, bringing it closer to the tree. Secondly, in section, we protected the tree by lifting the entire public realm and creating a bridge structure around the mature tree spanning approximately eight meters. So the void between soil and concrete is then filled with lightweight pumice stone. Uh, this way, no additional weight or very little additional weight is put on the root zone of the tree while rodents are kept out. So trees are not only important at ground level, they are at the heart of our landscape concept for the tower. Our concept was inspired by natural vegetation colonizing sculptural rock formations. You can see here on, on, on the left. Sky gardens aren't flat surfaces here, but they are three-dimensional gardens connecting different levels. In this way, the landscape, the outdoor habitat complements and enhances the very expressive and crystalline architecture. Promiston Tower is, is an intriguing symbiosis between built form and greenery on a very small uh, and irregular plot of land. A view from above. Maximize the usability of the space. The level six, seven, and eight trees are set in hardscape, but they have ample soil depth below the paving. So the sky terraces are designed for the enjoyment of tower dwellers, while its carefully crafted lower terraces give maximal greenery back to the city uh, for all to appreciate. We preserved the greenery that we could preserve, the tree at the, on the ground floor, and we maximized the greenery we could on the others. That way, we're tying Robinson Tower down to the city. From the ground, despite the big visual impact because of the terror, that on the longer term, the trees can grow a little bit further to create an even more continuous canopy. Planting within the public creates this vertical natural system from uh, this planting wrap encourages urban biodiversity. You know, I noticed there are quite a few butterflies already on the lower sky terraces. Views out were maximized, where long distance uh, where views in were kind of minimized. Uh, we want to create a bit of privacy also on the terrace. And shade and wind analysis further help refine the sky terrace layout. Uh, and, and the planting. So you can see the lushness of the vegetation and the pleasant space. You know, it, it's, it's a perfect place to recharge your batteries and escape your computer screen. You are in the middle of the city center here. The Kratoxylum cochicinense is a native tree, which does well on sky terraces. The leaves are bright green, but uh, the young leaves have a reddish tint uh, at, at the tip. All the leaves turn darker green, giving a lot of color depth from the red to the, to the gr dark green. The bark has this warm brownish color and, and flakes a little bit for that added texture. And the dappled shade creates uh, additional patterns on, on floor and walls. You know, a tree is all about biodiversity, but in this case, it's also about aesthetics complementing architecture. The sky gardens at night 
cloud-like patches of shade are dropped on the big cantilever. And when you get closer by, you're able to discern the intricacies of the leaf. And it's moving with the wind. The soffit is the perfect symbiosis of architecture, trees, and lighting. So let's continue with the theme of light and shade, but in daytime. On the top floor, the light filtered through the facade creates a beautiful scenery, and especially which is a bit more linear, it just creates a, a very rich texture. So we wanted to create different experiences on different levels, but all fundamentally green experiences. Let's move out of the city center and back to the ground plane with two projects alongside the same green corridor. The 24 kilometer long rail corridor is the site of the old rail link uh, from the city center of Singapore to Malay. It cuts through Singapore, uh, north south, and it passes alongside many residential areas, parks, and nature areas. So we participated to the, in the rail core competition in, in 2015. Uh, we didn't win the master plan at the time, but in recent years, we won uh, the implementation of, of two major nodes, designed for two major nodes alongside the corridor. On the right is a picture of the completed portion of the corridor, which is not done by Grant Associates. So this is a small stop we created alongside, alongside the corridor. It's about creating nature, removing undesirable species, and adding more native plants, which encourage biodiversity. The whole corridor wants to be low-key, rustic. It's a journey back into time when people live closer to nature. Meanwhile, the vegetated sites are a major corridor for wildlife. The green edges are mostly densely vegetated and inaccessible for people. They connect different nature areas. And one of the more iconic spaces alongside the corridor is the old Bukitima rail station. The landscape intervention here is, is a careful staging of the open space fronting and surrounding the station. It's about screening the more modern developments at the back here, allowing for community events and creative, creating an immersive experience. So we infuse this continuous linear landscape locally with a more heritage community focused landscape. A view from the other side, the planting is a bit more manicured here you can see here on the left next to the station master house, but it's still rustic. We also evoked the planting popular 50 years ago when the rail line was still very much in use. You would be surprised, but there, there are lots of fashions in, in, in planting. We don't plant anymore what we used to plant five years ago or 10 years ago. It's, 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 it, it's changes quite quickly. The corridor has become very popular even if it's only partially completed. It became a major local destination during the pandemic when most Singaporeans you know, were kind of pretty much uh, locked up here in Singapore. Um, the project will be completed uh, in the next month. This is a pre-construction picture. In the center is my project uh, leader explaining the, the landscape intent to both representatives of the Heritage Agency in red and the National Parks Agency in beige green. But look at the people in gray. On the right here with the gray hair is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and in the center, Lawrence Wong, our future prime minister. He was designated prime minister uh, a few weeks ago and he will become prime minister in a few months. This is small hair, this is, a, this is quite a small project. But heritage and landscape are important enough for national politicians to come out. This is about active nation building, reinforcing a shared identity for this young nation. Heritage places only make sense if they are set in authentic landscapes. A few kilometers station being another major note alongside the rail corridor, a completely different and more urban setting. There's a major MRT station just around the corner. As this is a major note, more activities are advisable in this particular spot. The program is still limited and the landscape continuity alongside the rail corridor is maintained. We referenced the rail heritage now, created some rest spaces. The rail corridor is different here because people are working and living close by. And so this particular note will attract more if you want it or not. And it, it will release some pressure from the actual corridor. And as always, we shouldn't forget the little ones who want to be active. We hope that we can implement this nature-based playground. The office building on the right is an existing one. On the left is the new development. So our bio 
this project encompasses both the landscape of the building and of the rail corridor. It allows us to create a nice seamless transition. The sky terraces are stepping down and planted to integrate the building better with it, within its environment. And uh, it avoids continuous overshadowing of, of the corridor. Construction on the project start on the left, uh, the foundation being made to, was probably a year ago. And on the right, you see uh, some of my colleagues and me on a cycling trip around Singapore, visiting more than 20 of our projects, including Biopolis. This is the real discovering quality space back to my physical health. This brings me to Singapore River. How do you move around in a city in nature? Like many cities in uh, Singapore, like many cities, Singapore was developed for cars in recent decades. And now we're trying to create spaces for alternative transport modes. We completed this route along Singapore. It's part of a wider cycle route network here in Singapore. And our part was part of the route going through the city center. Uh, so it's quite a complex uh, part. You know, the network doubles up as corridors for biodiversity where space permits. Yes, it's continuous for cyclists, but wherever possible, also the greenery is continuous. This is not mono monofunctional transport thinking, but a multi-layered mobility approach. Cycle network is designed for cycles, but will also be used by pedestrians, joggers, scooters, skaters, etc. So for us, there were two main challenges. Space was and is limited, as often is in Singapore. We're designing within an existing urban framework. There's limited space between river and riverside buildings. They're all already there. And we don't want to affect the existing old river wall. That, the second uh, challenge is that there are different users at different times of the days, all wanting to use space differently. Pedestrians and cyclists, the fast and the slow, the able and the less able, like you see on this picture, uh, individuals and groups. Carefully look at the planting here. This is the before. There's a disconnect between the path and the river. You can see the water over the plant. You, 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 no, you can't, you can't see the water over the planting. You can see the water between the planting. So there's, there's a disconnect. So we changed and lowered the vegetation to create that connection between people and water. Increasing visibility also improves the safety, not just the experience. That sometimes landscape is about simple, the small interventions. And in these areas, it's about carefully creating the space and making uh, very strategic uh, changes. While we have demarcated zones for wheels and pedestrians, everybody seems to be happily ignoring the markings. But are they? The markings are actually still very useful, even if they seem to be continuously ignored. The markings actually remind people that there are different users and that one should anticipate these other users at any time. We try to standardize the width of the cycle route, which meant that along a few stretches, we had more space. We narrowed the, the cycle pavement to the standardized width, but the remaining space, space was used for a separate slow path for pedestrians here alongside the actual river, or for resting spots like uh, here near Oldbridge, where we added garden swings. And the space between the, the, the main path and the secondary path, which you can just about see here, uh, was used for lush vegetation, especially trees, which can provide shade, which is very useful here in Singapore. The planting enhances the experience. It doesn't block the views to the water. It, it just creates viewing windows towards the, uh, towards the river. Noteboard key used to be a very undefined shape with no structure, no shade, no greenery, very loft, unloft, uh, and, 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 and hardly used. So at the new Noteboard key, we gently separated the dwelling space of the circulation space. You come out of the tunnel and you automatically follow the, uh, the actual designed uh, cycle route. We know that people will not just look at signs or markings. We just direct them in the right way. Um, and then on, on the right, we kind of keep some uh, dwelling space for activities. 
So our, our cycle route design is, is a careful balancing between interest groups and allowing as many people to enjoy the space and, and avoid conflict or minimize conflict, but space remains limited. A few hundred meters from the cycle route is Funan Mall. And believe it or not, but Funan Mall was designed to allow cyclists to cycle through the building in the early morning, different uses at different times. Funan is an innovative mixed use development, a new urban model for live, work, and play in Singapore city center. It offers retail, offices, and uh, service residences. The landscape is spread over different levels and it includes some larger green walls. Funans introduces a rich landscape uh, in the central city area. Funan is a clear example of a city in nature where an urban lifestyle benefits from nature drawn in from its surroundings. Funan Mall blurs traditional notions of functional zoning. This is a shop for millennials. Shopping is not anymore about display and sell, but about creating experiences and at some point sell. Inside, you can go rock climbing, enjoy food, or learn about the latest tech gadget. The complexity and excitement of the interior is, of the interior is continued to the exterior. So landscape and planting are an integral part of this overall experiential narrative. From wherever you approach the building, greenery is there to greet you. And the garden stairs take visitors from inside the mall to the seventh story. The rooftop garden features uh, outdoor leisure areas. You can see some futsal court here and an urban farm. The urban farm showcases uh, sustainable food production uh, within, with a range of technologies. The locally produced food is an asset for the local restaurants and exemplifies the fascinations of, fascination of Singaporeans with food and growing food locally. Singapore has set its goal to produce more food in Singapore. This is real farm to table food, not by bringing the table to the farm, but by bringing the farm into the city next to the table. Singapore has set a 30 by 30 target grow enough food locally to meet 30% of the local nutrition, nutritional needs. Currently, Singapore can only source 6% of its nutritional needs locally. And clearly, recent crisis in Ukraine and, and the pandemic has kind of made this even a more urgent uh, target. If we want to achieve 30 by 30, there will be a need for large scale food production in industrial looking estates. But we should also uh, integrate food in the current landscape and urban fabric of Singapore. Both will be needed. A project like Funan is not going to be a major contributor to the 30 by 30 goal in actual numbers. But projects like Funan can still be useful. They sensitize people. It demonstrates the opportunities to integrate food production in the urban fabric. And that's a major social component. It connects people with food production. So at the top of Funan, there's another garden with, again, a great variety of spaces. People can enjoy having a picnic on, or work uh, at the communal table between edible plants planted in the table. Greening is about beauty, biodiversity, but also about production and consumption. And this picture is not photoshopped. This is the center of Singapore, top of Funan Mall, and part of a landscape that produces food. We're on top of shopping mall, but one can breathe one can relax. It's a pure joy to be in a space like this. And in the background, you see the heart architecture, the older architecture of Singapore. We need buildings. We need cities. We need open spaces to fulfill different needs. But would it not be nicer to design and live in cities of nature? We can densify cities only if they look like this. The reef at Capital Day Bay creating spaces for biodiversity. A few years ago, this amazing opportunity came along to design a, design a landscape on the historic King's Dock. It's been an amazing design journey till now. Um, we always want to do something different in a project. And I think we, we definitely did here. The architectural typology of the urban village was also different. And so we created the landscape between uh, the architectural uh, components. And on land, we enhanced the livability by creating communities and circulating. 
hunting the dog. There are lots of constraints for the landscape, like fire engine access, ventilation shafts, but where possible, we created little enchanted gardens for walking and resting in the shade. But all noisy facilities have been kept away from the residential units. The floating concrete pontoon, the new floating concrete pontoon in the foreground here, turned the development inside out and created new opportunities for landscape on its fringes. So all the swimming pool facilities are, have been put uh, on the, the thing that makes noise in, in, in a condominium. Um, Singapore has experimented a lot with creating devices to enhance coral Kind of thing similar here, but for us, we but we wanted to see, we wanted to experience them. So here in the for, so in the foreground, uh, on the corner. So for the reef, we took uh, this a step further, the whole idea of growing corals, and then we carved out a pit within the corner of the pontoon. The open uh, pits are, are covered by nets where people can. Hang on over the corals. Well, let's see if I can kind of zoom in. Uh, and, and you can observe uh, the sea life below. So we work closely with environmental specialists and kept the viewing pit low tech. It's going to be an amazing space where you can be suspended above the sea life. And the corner is the perfect place because it will be open to two sides. So the seawater can flow naturally through the space and come in and out with the ties. We have also allowed for some corals on the side, uh, not visible for the some corals kind of fail. And achieving this combination of nature and human experience in a commercial project is, is really amazing. And I'm really very happy that the client embraced our ideas here. Another biodiversity uh, insertion in, in the project uh, is, is, is the dock wall. When I first visited the site with the client, the dock wall looked extremely gloomy. So you could see some plants popping up out of the wall. And this now will become the facade for the swimming pool on the pontoon, the prime area of the condo. So how can we do something more interesting, something more uplifting? Can the grubby dock wall be further colonized with planting? We have no intention to cover it entirely, not hiding the heritage, but we want to add a veil of planting in front of it. So we had a closer look at the existing wall. Clearly planting was already there, though struggling. So we did a survey and recorded 30 different types of plants which were growing on top of the dock wall on or between stone uh, and concrete. It's an amazing biodiversity popping up between stone and concrete. So we convinced the client to do a mock-up on site. We created and enhanced what nature was already doing to the wall. Give nature a little helping hand rather than create nature from scratch. A wild space of natural colonization. Uh, we don't want this to be a contained, precise uh, nature. So some people will consider these plants as weeds, but weeds are still plants. Just above sea level, very few plants can actually grow and thrive because of the salinity. So you can see the experiment with it from November 2019 to August 2020. So the lowest level was always going to be the trickiest parts because of the salinity. Um, the higher levels, we, we have much more plant choice and it, it picked up much faster. So looking at it after nine months, it, it not only survived, it really thrived. It, it looked brilliant actually without fertilization. You can't fertilize and let it slip all the fertilization into the seawater. The reef shows us how we can integrate biodiversity in a commercial project how wild nature becomes an asset, how we can green our coastlines and infrastructure. If we're gonna need seawalls and, and hard infrastructure to address the rising sea levels, we need to think about how to integrate greenery. Sometimes we just need to think outside the box to make Singapore a city in nature. The other side of the bay is Sentosa Island. 
The Sintosa Brownie Master Plan is a project of completely different scale and purpose, but nature is also at the core of the design approach. Sentosa is an island resort off Singapore's southern coast. It's very close to the city center. It's currently home to themed attractions, parks, lush rainforests, sandy beaches, hotel resorts, and lots of things. Uh, Brani is its northern neighbor, which is currently uh, used as a terminal. Uh, containers will move to the center. Brandy Island will be freed up for other activities. Sentosa will allow Sentosa to expand and to reinvent itself. So the aim is to integrate the two islands and to create a world-class leisure and tourist destination. So the master plan will be rolled out in phases over the next 20 years. Utilizing the new themed hotels, transport, and other commercial. Uh, projects. The master plan includes naturalizing the island of, of, of Bani. There are plans to restore natural habitats, including the coastal coral reefs. So, Sentosa will set itself apart as a tourist destination by fully embracing imagination and nature. So, nature is a key component in Sentosa's identity. And as Sentosa will reinvent itself, it just needs to ensure that nature remains as at the core of its new identity. Many other projects will come out of our master plan and I'm really, really looking forward to how this transformation will materialize in the coming decades. So we we'll learn a lot. So for the last project, I want to leave the physical context of Singapore. A few years ago, we won the Sino Singapore Friendship Power Competition in Tianjin Eco City. We applied similar principles as in Singapore, but we looked at the society of it and, and in a different, completely different context. Singapore Park has a water from conservatory and 600 meter wide canal in the foreground. But here, the comparison with Gardens by the Bay stops. And the site couldn't be more different from Singapore. I was quite shocked when I first visited the future site for Fringy Park. The site was very inhospitable for both nature and people due to soil and climate. I visited the site in wintertime, it was not pleasant. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Eco City has the expertise to deal with the saline soil, leaving us the designers to deal with the climatic discomfort. The cold winter is exacerbated by the strong northwest winds coming from Mongolia, which picks up speed again over the canal and which limits the plant growth on site. So even if Tianjin comes to life in springtime and seasonal variations and then color are dramatic, the park site, whenever we visited, remained quite barren and mute. And in winter, we noticed all the vegetation being temporarily wrapped up and fenced off. And you can see this big sock around the tree. Uh, we, we felt something radical. A big intervention was needed to tackle the microclimate. I don't want to design a park where half of the time I see green fences. You know, the challenges in front of us were completely different. During the competition, we also had major discussions about what friendship can mean for a park. What does it mean for two nations to have a fr joint friendship project? You know, and especially a big nation like China and a small nation like Singapore. And so we thought that a handshake, a handshake between the political leaders could symbolize two nations coming together to build a greener future together. Out of the handshake followed the idea of two large landforms. The main park feature, park feature which embraced the conservatory and shield the sun and the northwest wind. Friendship is about connecting and sheltering. So there's a political philosophical dimension to our handshake concepts, but also very practical physical, uh, physical landform sheltering. 
So the landform provides these conceptual and physical connections within the park, uh, and, 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 but most importantly, it shelves. The section illustrates the typical profile for the park. The landform here on the left deflects the wind, and the top topography also captures and conserves much of the water uh, on site. The design of the new landscape has been carefully crafted out of an understanding of the impact of all the natural elements on site. You know, the wind, the sun, potential future shades cast over the, over the park, uh, and, and, and then rain. The mass bench all the main features in the design, including the internal water bodies. So you will also notice the waterfront, which zigzags a lot, and this creates much more space for interaction between uh, people and water. There's something for everybody in the park. Friendship will be a fun place to be, and hopefully it will it will leave a lasting impression on its visitors. So we provided the eco city with a complex urban park, a very intricate design, and I think that's one one of the reasons we won the competition at the time. We just it's it's a typical case where a client puts a lot of things in a brief, and we just put it all in the park and added a few other things to it. Uh, and, and this is one of my favorite images of the competition. You know, the urban dock shows the coming together of people and nature in, the, in this wonderful setting. It's, it's the most urban part of the sponge city system. The sponge city is kind of a, uh, the, the Chinese uh, way of, of dealing and, and kind of uh, dealing with water in a sustainable, rainwater in a sustainable way. Um, and it's the place where people can touch the water. And then the uh, main water system cascades from the urban dock through the cascading water gardens to the wetlands. So the cascading gardens, all these sponge city requirements, we also create a variety of, of atmospheres and lands. So the final wetland area is the forest wetland. Um, by introducing islands and making it a forested wetland, we were able to create an immersive experience. Different here the, the, for the wetland, so we, we just needed to make it and more enclosed to so feel that completely surrounded by nature. Glimpses will not be overbearing, and so the construction is. is so it's, we haven't been able to visit the site in recent years, but this is a, a recent view from the waterfront, and we selected plants which can survive the northern slopes of the land, the most challenging area for plant growth. But they take time to establish. Uh, the growth might be a little bit stunted. It's it just slower. Um, and, uh, as conducive for plant growth, this area. And, and compare that to the area behind the landform. Uh, in the completed part, of French, the vegetation of the landform. Chen Jin reminds us that the Singapore model of, of city in nature is, is relevant, but the implementation around the world will be different. It's just not a, a copy paste. It, it needs to be, it is, there's an element of interpretation and adaptation. So while Singapore will look inwards to become more self sufficient, it will need to keep on looking outward to build and maintain friendships. What's better than building parks? for all to enjoy. So we've come to the end of this journey. Um, as landscape architects, we play an essential role in delivering a landscape or, or many landscapes that can contribute to a healthier and more resilient nation. First and foremost, we should be less wasteful with space. And, and, and Singapore demonstrates how we can densify and make open spaces uh, multi-usage. Our outdoor spaces need to become smarter and greener. So as landscape architects, we, we respond to specific uh, constraints. We address programmatic requirements. We consider the context and we respond to specific sites. And there are lots of objective steps we, we take within the design process. But landscape and, and, and nature needs to bind everything to, together, create a framework and add a sense of place. So even if the end result may look playful and delightful, 
there's a sound thought process that underpins, underpins uh, our landscape designs. We should exploit opportunities for greenery, the normal opportunities, but also the unusual and the unexpected. So while landscape architects are quickly gaining lots of skills and knowledge to address the problems we are facing today, we shouldn't forget beauty, sensuality and experience. Going back to the historic landscapes I showed in the beginning, what do we want to express with our landscape? What should people read into our designs? We need to add imagination and sparkle to turn the practical into a dream space, a space of desires. Landscape design needs to continue to transcend the practical, even if the practical will go, becomes more complex and more urgent these days. Landscape, in, in my view, should be exciting. It should touch people and create a sense of place and wonder. We can imagine and deliver not just a city in nature, but a wonderful city in nature. So I hope you enjoyed this journey through our Singaporean landscape project. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I, I'll clap and everybody else can uh, virtually clap. Um, I am sure that there will be some questions. And if you do have questions, please use the bottom of your screen here and uh, is a way to raise a hand and then we'll, we'll call you. And, Already, I see two questions here. The first one is from uh, Berk Ergos. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about, you know, on the topic of landscape architecture, like what problems arise when you're talking about a city? In my mind, I'm, I'm thinking about Istanbul for, as an example of this, where it's already so crowded and you have a lot of issues with like, you know, there's already a lot of architecture there and a lot of structures, but they're really old and maybe they need to be redone and whatnot. Um, but I guess, how would you bring something like landscape architecture to somewhere like that, where there's already a lot of established, there isn't a lot of open space, for example. Um, like, is it possible to use landscape ar architecture to like redo some of that space? Or is it more about taking space that hasn't been used yet and making sure that we like use it in a way that's forward thinking? Um. I think uh, cities continuously reinvent itself. So you see in, in, in Singapore, there is an old fabric, which is, you know, the, these rules weren't there from the beginning. So you see that it's, it's slowly evolving. Um, so I think, you know, in, in any city, uh, you know, there, there's a continuous reinvention. I think it's just about applying the rules to new development. Uh, it's also about, stopping probably the spread of the city and kind of the wastage of space. Uh, as to in when there is a, if you're in Istanbul, you're not gonna put uh, new trees on top of the Hagia Sophia. <laughs> I think there, there's clearly uh, a symbolic meaning, but actually Hagia Sophia is kind of also set probably within greenery uh, and, and it's respecting that greenery. Like a lot of, uh, a lot of old cities have, you know, squares and, 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 and there's greenery within their trees within the old fabric. So it's about preserving the greenery that's already there. And when there are new opportunities to, um, to plant things, then taking up these new opportunities. So I think we can, and, and the rate of transformation will be different. Like Singapore, it, it, it kind of has this, idea that it, it reinvents itself, you know, buildings have a relatively short lifespan here, um, which is not good. <laughs> um, but people are looking at kind of uh, actually reusing buildings more here, but even in the reusage of buildings, maybe you leave the structure um, and you can still integrate greenery. So for instance, here in Singapore, you have the, uh, the residential areas and you have the car parks. So you have a, a residential tower. It's very, uh, it's very rational. You have a, a tower, 20 floors high maybe, and then next to it, you have four floors, a car park. So what we see is that the top floor of the car park is, is heavily underutilized. Uh, and people start to put gardens on top of the car park because actually it's designed for car park, for, you know, for the load of ca cars. So if it can kind of carry cars, it can also carry plants. Um, so 
you see that transformation also of kind of old fabric here in Singapore without completely demolishing buildings. All right, thanks, Stefan. Um, next question comes from Yuaf Kashif. Hi, um, <clears throat> thanks. As, uh, as an amateur gardener, I, I found the, uh, your talk uh, especially interesting. I, I wanted to ask you um, about something that you mentioned in passing uh, at the beginning of, of the talk, and actually something that uh, people usually don't talk about, and that is cemeteries. So in, in um, uh, crowded uh, cities uh, like uh, you know, Singapore and Istanbul, and you know, I'm from Israel, so Israel as a whole is, is pretty crowded. Um, cemeteries have, at least in my opinion, have become a serious problem. You know, they take up uh, a lot of space, they keep on growing. And, uh, and the question is what can be done? Yeah, personally, I think that, uh, you know, uh, we should stop uh, burying people, but uh, assuming that my view is not uh, accepted, um, do you have, uh, you know, maybe I'm putting you on, 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 <laughs> uh, on the spot, but uh, do you have any ideas what can be done with uh, cemeteries? Uh, <laughs> yeah. To take up all of the, 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 the space. <laughs> okay. Um, cemeteries are also an issue here in Singapore. Um, because it used to be that everybody got buried. Um, so it's, it's, it's still the case, I, get, I think, for the Muslim minority here in Singapore, but the Chinese uh, more and more get cremated. Uh, and so it's, it's different. And you can see that actually cemeteries here in Singapore have slowly been pushed all the way to the edges of the, of the country. Uh, also, Chinese people don't like being around in, in cemetery areas. Um, so you, you see that, uh, and because of being superstitious, people don't want to redevelop cemeteries. But Singapore has really reached its limit of growth. So it needs to kind of reinvent itself and it started to uh, build residential areas on top of all the cemeteries. So yes, I think that's clearly that the strength here that we don't have, Singapore is growing uh, and we can't just, uh, can't also let the, the cemeteries grow. The cemeteries are kind of actually needing to shrink. Uh, and actually on the cemeteries, there are, there are amazing spaces, the old cemeteries. And just, um, and just on a personal note, there's an old cemetery here, not too far from where I live. And I love going there um, because it's overgrown, it has been abandoned 40, 50 years ago, and it will be redeveloped pretty soon, unfortunately, <laughs> because I really love the space because it's, I can go there in nature and you can see how it has turned into a secondary forest. Uh, and I, I had a close encounter with a civet cat. It's a very rare animal to see here in Singapore, but I, I just like going there, especially during the pandemic, um, early in the morning before anybody else goes there. Uh, and just, I saw this, this very amazing animal, uh, really upset that I couldn't take a good picture of it. So yes, cemeteries are slowly disappearing here. Uh, and in, in that process, that period before it's abandoned, you know, between being abandoned, no more new people being buried there and being used for redevelopment, it can actually be a, a very valuable nature area. I think if only a few weeks ago, I, I saw a wild boar um, running through the cemetery. So it's, it's a haven for wildlife at the moment, um, but it will be turned into residential in the coming decades. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Avery Fisher, you're next. Hey there. Uh, so I was interested in your landscape replacement requirements in Singapore and how that would require like terraces and extra roof weight for the gardens and a tapered base of the tower. And I was wondering about what kind of costs would come with that, either like monetary costs or climate costs with the more complicated construction. Okay. Um, the cost is, you know, developers know about it. It's part of uh, you buy that plot of land and you want to redevelop, they know that the landscape will be more expensive. But in the overall cost, it's still cheap. Um, they, when it comes to value engineering on a tower like that, you know, you just, there's not much room to maneuver. Um, so financially, the developers still make a healthy profit. 
uh, and if they can't make a healthy profit, they'll move on to another site. And then they're still, they're continuously redeveloping sites. I haven't seen it uh, stopping here in Singapore. Um, so it, it's, it's following a certain demand. And it's also a certain expectation. Like if, if you don't have a green terraces, you can't charge as much uh, as, as a, a new tower, which has lots of greenery. So it actually, from a marketing point of view, kind of the, the, the added value is there. The investment is relatively low. Uh, on your point on the, um, the environmental cost, yes. I don't think that nature on slab uh, and in towers is, is necessarily always the answer to the need for nature. Um, because um, there is all kinds of engineering. Uh, it, it's kind of an unnatural place for vegetation to be. Uh, and so we, we can see also on green walls, there's an evolution of, you know, green walls used to be a lot of plastic pots. And I think the plastic pot green wall still has, um, has a place in, in, in the greening of cities. But um, we're looking more and more at kind of you know, can we have alternatives to this kind of system? So that's where, for instance, on, on the dock wall of, uh, of the reef, um, we went out to three contractors to kind of get a, get a price for, for the mock-up. And we had a design. And some of the contractors came back and came back with their uh, specific uh, products, which was metal and, and plastic and kind of all kinds of things they wanted to put on the dock wall. I said, no, it, it just needs to be low tech. It's the greening of, of, uh, of, of, of the sky terraces uh, shouldn't be necessarily too much high tech. Yes, it's high tech in being smart, but not high tech in kind of building and constructing it and then having a negative uh, impact on, on, the, on the wider environment and the construction process. So um, we just need to be sensible. If we do on sky terraces, it should be, it should be able to survive if for some reason the irrigation uh, doesn't work for two, three days. It, it, it should be resilient and it should be able to, um, to survive on its own. Uh, and if you think about Angkor Wat, uh, which you know, is a lovely space, like things can grow on buildings. Like the, the reef perfectly shows that plants survive in very harsh conditions. Uh, so we, we just need to create better conditions for the plants. And yes, we make it a little bit more, less environmentally friendly by putting it on top of a, of a building. But I think we just need to be sensible, minimize that impact and maximize the, minimize the impact on the wider environment on kind of a construction, uh, the negative construction aspects, but maximize the impact on the people that actually use the space. Hey, um, thanks. Let's have uh, Yuan Tao Gao now. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have one question about um, basically the wildlife. And so I have heard that for um, like city in Chicago, um, for the wild birds, migration birds, it's very dangerous for them, you know, to fly around across, you know, for the like facade uh, reflection, the window. Uh, and it's especially for like floors that is below 10th floor. So like one to 10th floor like that. And I'm uh, talking about the full, uh, the full, uh, full 10 mile that you are showing um, for the sky terrace, is that like being any consider about the birds that, you know, they can utilize that space as a habitat. Um, so yes, I think the birds flying into facades, uh, it's, 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 has been an internal problem. Um, and so uh, it's not something that I personally deal with, uh, but I, I have been in meetings where the architects have kind of uh, shared their devices or their strategies to avoid birds flying into uh, buildings. I think it's a, you don't want that when you're on the ground floor, a bird dropping on top of your head. Um, so I think architects are perfectly able to deal with uh, that issue and then the glazing manufacturers. Um, as to the, uh, the attracting of birds on, on our sky terraces, yes, they will attract birds. They, they, they will find their way there. It might take a while, 
Um, like I remember uh, we worked with a biodiverse, one of my first projects, I, I used a biodiversity specialist to kind of try to see how can we attract butterflies. And they told me, yeah. oh, it will take two years for butterflies to go and discover your, your place. But animals are, are quite adaptive, and especially if they, they are already there in the surroundings. Um, and then so I often see wildlife appearing during construction. Um, you know, you, you, it's still kind of things are being constructed, but there are already a few trees planted. Uh, you know, food is food and animals will find the food. So, it, but that, that, that's where the, a network of greenery is very important because birds will kind of move alongside green, especially smaller animals will move alongside corridors. Birds can kind of make bigger jumps. So if, if you have a network going through the whole of Singapore, they will find and their preferred food places. Um, it's, of course, if you have a complete city of, of complete metal in, in glass, and, and no greenery, uh, where does the bird come from? It's, it's kind of, you know, and for instance, butterflies, we, we, we're looking at kind of creating a butterfly trail on a project in, in China at the moment. It's very simple. You need place for a caterpillar and you need a place for the butterfly. Uh, and you just need to think about the life cycle of those animals. It's not big science. It's very primary school science. You know, uh, an animal needs a few things and just provide these. And you, you don't know the, the perfect mix. And, and, and yes, there is a, there's a whole knowledge being built up at the moment about these plants will attract these kind of animals. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's more intuitive. Um, we just provide some space. We provide some, some food, some, some place for them to, uh, to reproduce. Uh, and then um, things will happen. And, and so gardens, by the way, is a, is a perfect example. It was designed, you know, the, the, name of, it, the names in, of the lakes in, inside gardens, by the way, there's Kingsfisher Lake and Dragonfly Lake. Nobody ever thought about calling it Otto Lake. <laughs> um, it's just, you, you design for the small animals, but as soon as the small animals appear, the, the predators will come. And, you know, and if the predator, the small predator comes, maybe the bigger predator comes. I don't think the tiger will kind of come back in Singapore, um, but it, that would be a great success. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Sid, go ahead. So, um, this is maybe a rather Chicago-centric question, but uh, you know, what you described in Singapore is almost utopian. I mean, everyone wants the parks and everyone made the parks. But I could imagine, uh, at least if that was here in Chicago, it would be a tremendous fight to, to get uh, parks made and new parks made and keep uh, buildings out. And I, I just wonder how that actually took place. It, was there a, was it a top-down decision that someone had control of this that made it happen or was somehow, uh, you know, everyone kind of involved got uh, you know, agreed on this. I mean, uh, how did the politics get uh, made in this direction? Um, it was top down, partially, uh, but the top down only works if there's a support from the down. Um, but I think uh, when Singapore became independent, it was really at the bottom. Um, it was it was not rich. Uh, it, it didn't have any natural resources. It, its only resources were people, poor people. Um, and so I think that the government being actually being in a permanent state of crisis or starting in that state of crisis, uh, create a sharpness in, in, in politics. Um, and so I, I showed that picture of the first prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, planting its, its, its first tree. And, and it's still kind of being used. You see it coming back in, in, in lots of publication, that picture. It is, you know, it, it's a start of, of, of a movement. And also Singapore not having, you know, how, how can Singapore become, you know, a, not necessarily a first world nation, but how can it uh, kind of get out of its poverty status? Uh, it, it wanted to attract foreign investment. And so it wanted to create a green picture of Singapore towards visitors and especially foreign investors. 
When you look at the pictures of Singapore in the beginning after independence uh, in the urban areas, there's not much greenery. It's very bleak. It's very uh, not very nice, especially if you know that there is a sun and you don't have shade in the public space. So when you land in Changi Airport, Changi Airport is, has been turned into a green or an airport with green elements. And I understand uh, one of your lecturers later might be talking about it. Uh, but when you land from Singapore Airport and you go to the CBD, you have this big uh, highway, which is uh, lined with big rain trees, which are these big trees hanging over the, the highway. So it's kind of really, you enter Singapore and you have that green, um, you have a green image. Because you know, if, if you want to, for instance, compete with Hong Kong, uh, and you want to be that kind of city state that is kind of uh, uh, business friendly, you want to attract uh, you want to attract businesses and, and, and you want those businesses to, to be able to bring their top people or bring high level people to Singapore. You don't want their factories necessarily, but you want their decision centers, local decision, their regional centers here in Singapore. So, you know, Singapore is happy, you know, if they can attract Facebook to have the Southeast Asian headquarters here is great. You know, people speak English, that helps, of course, um, but it's, it's a business-friendly climate, but it's also a green climate because those business people, they, they have children, you know, they, 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 they have time. What do they do in the weekends? You know, they, they, you might not have all the museums you have in Chicago or New York, but you have greenery to go outside. So that's kind of livability aspect uh, is, is, is very important. So, and then that has been carried through the generations. So Singapore started from uh, a garden city, which was a traditional kind of 19th century English model uh, to then it evolved to a city in garden and now it's city in nature. Now I kind of portray here a very utopian, utopian image with our Grant Associates projects. So I show the nice bits of Singapore. There are also bits that are not so nice yet. And yes, it is a battle um, because there are different interests. Greening has been accepted by all actors in society that there is a need for greenery. How much greenery? There might still be a debate. Um, but there, there is that acceptance that there is a minimum level of greenery. We're trying to push for that greenery not necessarily in area, because that's something that we can't win necessarily, but the quality. I think if, if you have a project like Gardens by the Bay where you have the super tree, all of, a sudden, all of a sudden the super tree becomes that symbol of a nation. And it's like, you know, you have the Eiffel Tower in France, 19th century engineering kind of, you know, ability and uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. 21st century, you have the super tree. It's kind of a completely different device uh, and, and, and it will disappear as, as the other trees grow. But it's, 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 I, we need to kind of reinforce that identity all the time. We need to create these projects. We need to, and I think that that's, that's I think maybe it should be a new point to my, to my lecture, but we should kind of keep on having new, exciting nature because only by keeping it fresh, keeping it exciting, will the support remain to keep on greening Singapore. Sorry, a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, wonderful. I, I think there's also a, a great point to conclude this lecture. Uh, very nice, uh, comprehensive perspective that you put out there. So thank you again. Thank you mm -hmm. very, very much. And thank all of you for listening. Thank you.